love endures forever For He is good, He is above all things His love endures forever Sing praise Good morning to you, and uh, a particular welcome if this is your very first time with us here at St. Mary's. It's great to have you join us, and if you're joining us online, it's great to uh, have you with us as well. My name's Rob. Uh, I'm the lead minister here at the church. Well, I wonder how it is you approach God this morning. Perhaps you approach Him with fear, fear of condemnation because of things that have happened, perhaps with a sense of uncertainty, thinking, I wonder what He makes of me, or whether He even cares. And those fears might be justified, except that God has promised to redeem us through the Lord Jesus. And because of that, He cares. Uh, Here's what Psalm 103 says, "'Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits.'" who forgives your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Uh, To redeem is to buy something back. It's to change ownership of a person. And the psalm reminds us that God has redeemed His people from the pit to crown us with love and compassion. 
So let's stand and sing to that God who redeems his people in the words of every day I'll bless you. played the game, what happens next, okay? So we are going to see three video clips, and you've got to decide what happens next in each of them, okay? So, um, Chris, are you all right for the first one? answers. There's A, B, or C, and you've got to decide which one you think happens next. Does the boxer on the left knock down the one on the right? Does the boxer on the left knock out the referee? <laughs> or do both boxers knock each other down at the same time? Okay, so A, B, or C. I want you to stand up if you think it's A. That's the boxer on the left knocks down the one on the right. No one. Oh, one person. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> Does the boxer on the left knock out the referee? Oh, quite a lot. Okay, you can sit down. Does, do both no boxers knock each other down at the same time? Okay, let's see.
water before stepping onto Northern Ireland? Oh, a few. Oh, yep. Okay. Does Ireland tip over, sending her into the water? Uh, a few more. Okay. And C, does one of the guys trying to help her fall into the water? Okay. Let's see. Okay, there's the next one coming. Okay, so does the golfer's ball Roll into the other one, sending it into the water. A. B. Does the golfer's ball roll into the other one, sending it past the hole whilst going to the hole itself? No. Or C. Does the golfer's ball roll into the other one, sending it into the hole? His opponent's ball into the hole. Okay? So, if you think A, it rolls it into the water, hits the other one and rolls it into the water, stand up. No. Oh, thank you, Jill. One person. <laughs> Okay, B, does the golfer's ball roll into the other one and send it past the hole whilst going into the hole itself? <coughs> Few, not many. So, C, does the golfer's ball roll into the other one, sending that one into the hole? <laughs> oh, most of you. Okay, let's see. Well done, the few of you who said B, it was, yes, well done. Now, it is important, isn't it, what happens next in any story. It's, tr it's important what happens next. And actually, that's really important in the Bible, because the Bible starts with God creating the world. And his purpose is to have his people living in his place and living with him as king. But very quickly, that all goes wrong. And actually, God's people, because they rebel against God, they get kicked out of God's special place. But God still, his purpose still stands. And so, he promises that he is going to again have his people living in his land, living with him as king. Now, over the next three weeks, we're going to watch what happens next in the children's groups. We're going to watch a DVD and we're going to see what happens after the family. It's grown to be a big family. Abraham's had children and grandchildren. It's a big family, but it's not a whole load of people. And our story starts today where they're not living in God's special land. And they're not really living with God as king. We're going to discover what happens next. And will God's purpose be fulfilled? You'll find out about that in your groups, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have your purpose to have a people living in your land, living with you as king. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we know that your purposes always come to completion. Please would you help us as we watch this DVD and see your plans coming at about that we would trust you more and love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, happening next is that we're going to head out to our children's group. So if you don't know where you're going, please do speak to one of the stewards, and they'll be very happy to direct you. For those of us who are still in the building, uh, let's um, turn to someone we haven't come with today and uh, ask how they're doing and what they've been up to this week.
Well, if I could uh, interrupt conversations. Please, as ever, do continue conversations afterwards. Uh, tea and coffee's outside or opposite. And um, uh, it may just be worth saying that the children's group may not finish quite as we finish. So just bear that in mind as we go, if you're going to take tea and coffee in the hall opposite. Uh, otherwise, outside is absolutely fine. Um, just in terms of church notices, you would have been given a notice sheet on the way in, and uh, there's a few things to, to look at uh, in, in those notices. But I just want to highlight one thing, which is our director of operations job, which has um, been advertised this week. Uh, back in the autumn on our Giving Sunday, uh, me, the church wardens, and um, C, uh, the uh, uh, Christian Workers' Trust uh, presented a kind of uh, given appeal for three staff positions, one being a part-time music uh, minister, a youth and families minister, and an associate uh, minister as well. And fortunately, we've got the part-time music minister sitting behind me, and uh, the youth and families minister is probably recovering from last week. Uh, but um, in terms of an associate role, uh, we wanted that role because we wanted to provide a kind of consistency of ministry and a bit of support for me um, uh, to, with the teaching. Um, as we looked at that role, uh, partly we found that actually it's not m immediately clear-cut how we could get that role. In this diocese, associates aren't common, and so we need to think that through a bit more. Uh, but then I was given the good news that Tom would be our curate this year, and um, uh, I'll explain more about that in a moment. But um, with Tom secured, that took the immediate pressure off um, the requirement for an associate. So um, as a PCC and as a church, we've been thinking about this for a, uh, a while, and I mentioned this at the APCM, that we were wondering whether having an associate-level person, but perhaps more devoted to the practical elements of leading the church, uh, would be the way to go. Um, also, what happened at the beginning of this year is that Fiona left the team, and um, we realized that she did a lot of work on uh, governance and running uh, the church building. Uh, we also saw Philip um, uh, hand over the reins of church warden, and uh, Philip was retired at that point and able to do a lot, um, and he still does a lot, but um, we just felt that actually there's a big chunk of work to do at that kind of operations level. And of course, in Acts 6, we see this principle laid out, don't we, that actually... Um, when uh, practical arrangements come up, the apostles at that point give over that responsibility to spirit-filled uh, people with the right character who are able to uh, look after those practical arrangements while the apostles uh, devote themselves to word and prayer ministry. So that's um, the thinking behind this new role. I realize it is a new one for us at St. Mary's, but quite a few churches are a similar size to us and a similar stage, uh, do you have this sort of role? It's called director of operations. Someone thought that sounded a bit sort of like um, covert ops or something like that. Uh, <laughs> it's not that you don't have to be a spy or anything, uh, but that's generally what the title's called. And we hope that um, we get uh, the right person with the right character who's gospel-minded, who can take on that kind of legislative governance, safeguarding role, also lead some of our staff devoted to more practical things, uh, look after the buildings, and also be forward-thinking on terms of budget and strategy uh, going forward. So um, that's the hope, and uh, we've got to the end of this, uh, September uh, with this role, so please do pray for that, and um, please do advertise it to anyone you know. I'm sure between us we probably know thousands of people, so uh, please do um, make that known. And maybe even some of us here might want to think about applying as well, which you're very welcome to do. So um, that's the associate role. Now, at this point, we were due to have an interview with our new curate, who I mentioned there, Tom and Rosie. Um, this was actually meant to take place four weeks ago, I think, and uh, Tom got COVID. Uh, then there were all sorts of complications, and this was meant to be the week. Uh, but their car had other ideas. Um, so... <laughs> Sadly, as they've returned from Northumberland, apparently two hours into the journey, their car had conked out and broke down near York, and uh, that's where they currently are as well, <laughs> as far as I know. Um, they had a really rotten day yesterday with breakdowns and um, getting the car fixed. It turns out it's a cam belt, um, so not pretty. Uh, but Tom's hoping to be back this evening, so do pray for Tom and Rosie this, this evening. 
But just to assure you, we have got a curate, <laughs> and he is real, um, and you will meet him. And God willing, uh, I've said that we'll meet him next week, even though I'm on holiday, someone else can introduce him. So that's next week. But I thought in, uh, in the space, uh, it'd be great to hear a bit about M&M from last week. So I've asked Rupert with about 30 seconds notice to just fill us in on how M&M went. So first of all, just tell us what M&M is and what you've been doing for the last week. Uh, yeah, so uh, Madness and Mayhem Holidays. Uh, so uh, we uh, have uh, uh, three camps within one, really. Uh, and in some ways, it's kind of five camps within one. So the three camps are Max, Madness, and Mayhem, uh, ranging from nine-year-olds through to 18-year-olds. Um, we also have a Minions program, which is the uh, Little Children of Leaders, um, which is a growing number. Um, and then we have a scheme called 1045ers, which is our training scheme for young leaders. Mm. Uh, so that's what M&M is. And what have you been doing with it this week? So, so yeah, so uh, we, the theme of our week this week was uh, a year and a week. So we started off with New Year's Day <laughs> and came all the way through to Boxing Day uh, yesterday. Uh, so our last night party was Christmas themed, uh, which was <laughs> Not great right. fun. Um, <laughs> And uh, so a typical day is, is that the, in dorm groups, they do quiet time Bible studies together. Um, they'll do lots of fun activities on the site. So the site is purpose built with uh, high, high ropes and zip wires and a lake where they can do raft building and canoeing and all those sorts of things. They'll do activities in their dorms as well. So they get to know each other really well. Um, and then there's a main teaching session each day. And so this year we were doing a theme on God Speaks. Uh, starting right back from the way that God spoke through creation, uh, asking us the question, which voices do we listen to? You know, and, and thinking about uh, sin coming into the world in Genesis 3. We did the Valley of the Dry Bones, which was brilliant, just mm. um, the way that God speaks and, and life can come from death. Uh, and going right through to the cross and the resurrection, and then helping young people to think about which voices they're going to listen to um, and how they're going to respond to the gospel as they go away. Uh, so so th that's a kind of a little bit of a snapshot. Yeah, of sounds what great. We're it sounds, sounds like I'd need to hear it as well, and I'm sure lots of us do. Um, yeah, who are we going to listen to? It's a great, mm, great yeah. question. Um, the, uh, any encouragements from the week? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, first of all, it was great to be back together again uh, for mm. a whole week. Uh, obviously, we've not been able to do that for the last couple of years. Um, and I think young people generally really appreciated that. Um, some were coming back uh, for a week thinking, I can't wait to get stuck in again, really looking forward to it and had a lovely time. Uh, some, if I'm honest, um, found coming back into that environment quite difficult. Um, and actually, spiritually speaking, some people came with quite hard hearts, but it was great to see the way that um, hearts were softened over the course mm. of the week. Um, and there were some real encouragements of people who... Uh, became Christians for the first time, um, and uh, were really encouraged to keep going on with the Lord. Uh, so that, that, that was definitely an encouragement. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm conscious that we're only sort of halfway through the two weeks, so mm. there's a week happening this yeah. week. I mean, how can we pray for that? Yeah, great. Uh, that would be fa ahead. fantastic. So uh, week two of M&M is happening at the moment, which is led by Will and Anna Ely, and um, there are a number of other folk that we know who are there now. Um, so slightly smaller camp, about 80 young people, uh, but uh, it'd be great to be praying for them as they go through that week, that they'd keep safe and that there would be a desire to, to listen to God speaking to them mm. too. Mm. Thank you very much, Rupert, and sorry to spring that on you, but uh, it's, it's really, really encouraging to hear. So thank you for um, sharing that, and thank you for our prayers. Uh, thank you to your, uh, you know what I mean, <laughs> thank you for your prayers. Uh, uh, and uh, do keep praying. Um, let's, uh, we're going to come now to uh, just be, uh, to hear God's Word. Uh, before we do, it's right, isn't it? We acknowledge our own uh, failures and shortcomings. Uh, we heard right at the beginning that our God is a God who forgives sins, who redeems our life from the pit. And so here's some words that Paul speaks to a church uh, in Ephesus. He says this, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. 
all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. And so we come to say these words of confession. We say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Paul goes on to say this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And so we pray for each and every one of us, Father, as we acknowledge our sins before you that you, by your Spirit, would reassure us of your great love for us, expressed through the grace that is seen in the Lord Jesus. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing of that uh, God who redeems us from the pit in the words of Come Behold, the Wondrous Mystery. i 
Bible reading is taken from Ruth 1, verses 1 to 22. This can be found on Church Bible, page 267. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a farming in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Opa and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her, and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would, leave, lead, that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you would find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was hope, there was still hope for me. Even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, Would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this, they wept again. Then Opera kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Luke said, Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Tsunami returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her, daughter's in-law, her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Mike Stevenson, if you don't know me, and we're starting a new mini-series on the book of Ruth. It's my job to set the scene with chapter one, and then Alex, Tim, and Leon will take you through the rest of the story over the next three Sundays, one chapter at a time. How can you tell if you're sticking to the straight and narrow path and haven't just wandered onto the wide and easy path that leads to destruction, the popular path that most people follow. 
That was one of the questions arising from our studies on the Sermon on the Mount. Am I in good standing with the Lord? Do I know him and talk to him and ask him to direct me in all the decisions of my life? Have I built my life on the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ? Or do I just go with the flow and do what feels good at the time until I get myself into trouble and need to start again? Well, I hope that Ruth will help us with this question. The name Ruth means friend or companion. And my prayer is that the book of Ruth will be a good friend to you as you make good decisions to walk that narrow path with Jesus and avoid the wide path. Let me pray for us to hear God speak through his word to us today. Dear Lord, the Bible is full of real life stories of ordinary people who became part of your plan to save us. Help us to see how you worked in their lives, in their times, so that we can trust you to work in our lives now, in our times. In Jesus' name and for his glory, we pray. Well, our outline today is uh, three points, as normal. Spiraling down, where we see a people in decline. Sticking with God, where we look at a pleasant faith. And seeking God's way. Is there a promise that we can live by? So first of all, spiraling down, a people in decline. If you've got that passage in front of you, look at the first few words of the first chapter, the first line. In the days when the judges ruled. This isn't the UK in 2022, although some things don't change. But we must take ourselves back to the nation of Israel around 1200 before Christ, to the time when the judges ruled. You will have heard of some of these judges because their stories are well known. There was Samson with his supernatural strength, but his weakness for women, particularly Delilah, was his undoing. Then there was Gideon, the reluctant leader who insisted that God prove to him that he should be one of the leaders, one of the judges, by his wet and dry fleece test. But even with these famous men and a woman, one of the judges was a woman, and their life stories of miraculous strength and victorious battles, despite their often glaring weaknesses, on the whole, the book of Judges is not a happy read. God's people were in decline. There was a pattern of behavior that was repeated throughout the 200 years that these judges ruled. And you can see it taking place in five stages. Firstly, the people of Israel turn away from God. They worship made-up gods and indulge in all kinds of evil practices. I won't go into those, but you can read them yourself if you look through Judges. Secondly, they then suffer defeat by their enemies because God is no longer protecting them. So thirdly, they turn to God in desperation for his help. And fourthly, the Lord answers their prayers by giving supernatural strength to a man or a woman, the judge, who delivers them from their troubles. But fifthly, and sadly, when the judge dies, they go back to their evil again. Only this time, worse than before. And so the cycle continued. And every time it was repeated, their evil practices got worse and worse. They were in a downward spiral. Let me read you how this worked out in Judges 2. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshipping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. And it's into this seemingly endless downward spiral that the Bible starts a new chapter with a new book 
the book of Ruth, a love story. And the book starts in the middle of another cycle of evil practice leading to God removing his protection and favour on Israel. And to cap it all, they are suffering from a famine, another sign of God's anger with their evil practices. What do you do when you're suffering from famine? To whom do you turn? The food banks are running out. And rather than wait for God to turn things around under another godly judge, one family, Elimelech, Naomi, and their two sons, Marlon and Kilian, decide to emigrate. Why don't we make a new start in Moab? Well, there are many reasons why not. Choosing the Moabites as your place of safety and provision is probably not the best choice. But it's also not the worst. God had instructed Israel not to invade Moabite territory because they're the descendants of Lot and God had promised them a land to live in. So you might think that makes an ideal place of safety. But that's not the whole story. Rather than showing brotherly kindness to Abraham's descendants, the Moabites had been a constant problem for Israel. Hear what God says about the Moabites in Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 23. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord. Not even in the tenth generation, for they didn't come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt. And they hired Balaam to pronounce a curse on you. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. When Israel was struggling on their journey from Egypt to the promised land, they asked the Moabites for some help, for some food. They received nothing. And not only that, but the Moabites hired the prophet Balaam to bring curses on them. Well, it didn't work. God brought blessings instead. But God warns them not to make treaties with these people as long as you live. Now, if you were a godly Israelite man seeking a place of safety for your family, would you choose Moabite territory? Well, it appears that Elimelech didn't make godly choices for his family. He didn't walk the straight and narrow path. His wife and two boys might have had little influence in this decision. And as Elimelech dies shortly after arriving, he leaves his family having to make a life for themselves away from God's blessing and protection. I'm afraid it was typical of the people of Israel at that time. They would ignore God's ways, do their own thing, and when disaster strikes, they don't immediately ask God for help, but continue on the wrong path. They marry outside of the tribe and adopt the idolatrous ways of their new husbands and wives. And the boys do marry Moabite girls. But before they're blessed with families of their own, they both die as well and leave Naomi without anyone to provide for her and with the additional liability of two Moabite widows to care for. Well, it's not been the most successful emigration that you could hope for. After 10 years in Moab territory, Naomi is in a sorry state. Now, the usual pattern would be for Naomi to have a moan at God and to receive his help, but then only half-heartedly to walk on the straight and narrow before returning again to the wide path to destruction. But our story marks the beginning of a bright new future. At first, first you might struggle to see anything different because Naomi does blame God. But there's something promising that we don't find in the book of Judges. Two things show us that this little family on the wrong path and in the wrong place hadn't completely lost their faith in God. The first is Naomi's decision to return to Bethlehem. And the second is Ruth's promise. Both widows trust their future to God. 
In the middle of grief and despair, you still have to make decisions. So let's see how Naomi and Ruth do this as we look at our second point, sticking with God, where we see a pleasant faith. Now, Naomi doesn't see it at the time. She can't. She's grief-stricken, desperate, and bitter. But even in her state of despair, her faith in God didn't desert her. Notice how she speaks about the Lord's kindness and the Lord's rest in verse 8. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. Well, two Moabite widows arriving in Israel might not expect a warm welcome. Widows needed a family to support them. Naomi couldn't support them. She begs them to go back and find a Moabite husband. Well, Orpah kisses her goodbye, and she doesn't feature in the story anymore. But Ruth's decision is the key to the whole story. More than just family love, Ruth has seen something good, something right, and something certain in Naomi's faith. Naomi might have lost sight of it in her distress, but what Ruth has seen, she stakes her life on. All of us face decisions every day, some big, some small. I think this one must be up there on the big decision top 10 list. I would say it's probably number one. Will you make peace with God and join his family? Or will you simply return to your old ways? Will you make peace with God and join his family? Or will you simply return to your old ways? Isn't it interesting that Ruth sees this as choosing Naomi's God? I don't know about you, but I can think of one person who so impressed me that I wanted to know the God that he followed. Maybe you can think of somebody in your life who convinced you to follow Jesus. Ruth chose Naomi's God. And we can only guess why it was Ruth and not Orpah who chose to stick with Naomi. Maybe Marlon was a godly husband, schooled in the faith by his parents. Perhaps it was just the way that Naomi stuck to her faith through the tragedy of losing her husband and then both sons. We just don't know how Ruth came to this decision, but we are told that she's found something worth giving everything for, something to cling on to no matter what the consequences might be. So finally, we come to the third point. Seeking God's way. A promise to live by. Let's spend a moment looking at the key to the whole story, what Ruth does and how she does it. We've seen that she makes a decision and she seals this with a promise, and not just any old promise, but a covenant promise. She uses the language of the law courts, the language of a marriage ceremony, till death us do part. Verse 16, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Have you made that covenant with the Lord? Where you go, 
I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Where I die, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. These words might come from a baptism service. We've died with Christ. We've risen with Christ. We will live with him. In some ways, Ruth was ahead of her time. Her covenant was with her mother-in-law's faith and her mother-in-law's God and people. But it's the language of the gospel where we make our promises to our Lord Jesus and his people. It's the language of our God because we have a promise-keeping God who asks us to follow him, to walk the narrow path with him day and night in good times and bad, to be one of his people demonstrating his glory to the world. Well, this is the answer that stops you being stuck in the revolving door, the cycle of spiraling down. Failing to live God's way can end because of the gospel, the covenant that he makes with us and we can make with him. If you're on the wrong path, you may not realize it until the crunch comes. But sometimes we notice there's something about somebody else's life. And compared to them, we feel as though we're living in the dark. We don't really know God and his love and protection in our lives. Well, the book of Ruth is a love story that shows us there is another way. Ruth chapter 1 starts with a family going off on their own, a decision that takes them away from God's blessing. But God's still at work, and he uses that decision to bring about his gospel plan for the world. Ruth chapter 4 ends with a family tree that leads us to a king. Ruth is in the family line of King David. And we know also King Jesus. And 3,200 years later, we can make a big decision too. We know that following Jesus, walking his way, leads to life eternal. But Ruth doesn't know that, nor does Naomi. Who would have believed it in those days that God would choose a Moabite widow with everything stacked against her to give us the most intimate love story, a picture of God's intimate love for us? But I'm getting ahead of chapter 1. We must finish today with Naomi's return home. Bethlehem means house of bread. Why does she ever leave? How could she allow her husband to entice the family away from God's people and God's blessing just because of a famine? She returns home. A distraught, and bitter widow, a shadow of her former self. When she rolls up in her hometown, people can't believe what they see. What has happened to Naomi? They can hardly recognize her. And like the prodigal son returning home, she has her speech prepared. But do you notice in Jesus' story, the prodigal son doesn't get to speak it? I wonder if Jesus had this story in mind when he told the story of the lost son. God the Father knows our hearts so that if we resort to writing speeches, God doesn't need to hear it. He's just overjoyed when we come back home to him and gets busy with the welcome party. Well, the people of Bethlehem were not so sure that seeing Naomi was good news. And she does get to give her speech to explain what has happened. Verse 20. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. The name Naomi means pleasant. Don't call me that. There's nothing pleasant about me now. Just call me bitter, Mara. 
That name suits me now. Well, what kind of a speech is it? Where's the admission of guilt? There's not a word about the beautiful covenant promise that Ruth has made. Ruth doesn't even get a mention. Speech is a poor old me's speech. It's not my fault. Why is everything against me? Why is the Lord picking on me? Perhaps that's why Jesus gives the prodigal son a proper repentant speech. We think of ourselves and our hard luck stories and find it hard to say sorry to God and his people. Well, the good thing you can say is that she's back. She's back home where she belongs with her people. It's like she's gone back to church. I thought I'd finished the sermon when I got to this point, but last night I couldn't sleep. It was either my conscience or the Lord speaking to me. Who do you think you are to dismiss grief so lightly? There are many people in the congregation who could have told that story much better. If you were a Ukrainian widow whose entire family had been wiped out by a Russian missile and you escaped to England with nothing to show for your life's hopes and dreams, and yet you remain hopeful and thankful for all the good times that you'd had. Now, maybe you could say that Naomi was wrong to be bitter, but you're not. Naomi was telling me how it was. She was bitter. She was grieving. I was fine with that. So, with the Lord's correction, let me say, this is a tragic story. Where is the happy ending that we long for? Well, the author gives us just a little hint that things might improve. These two women have made the bold decision to go with God. The richer, the poorer, in sickness and in health. Till death do us part. They're back in Bethlehem, the house of bread, just as the barley harvest was beginning. We'll come back next week to see if anything good comes from this tragic story. As a little taster, let me say that the nickname Mara never catches on. People of Bethlehem know what it's like to suffer. They know what it's like to be bitter. Naomi is still called pleasant Naomi, sweet Naomi, for the rest of our story. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, you know what we've been through in our lives. You know all the choices that we've made. We're sorry that sometimes we've chosen the wrong path and it's hurt us. And at other times we've suffered loss and distress when we thought we were walking on the right path and we don't understand what happened and why. But you know that and you understand all the difficulties in our complicated lives. Lord, please take us as we are, whether we're still bitter about things and in despair or enjoying life and hopeful or maybe somewhere in between. Teach us lessons from the book of Ruth. Please show us how to cling to you like Ruth did to Naomi, how to trust you for our future hope and our place of safety with your people. Amen. Last week, Caroline suggested several ways that you can make the most of summer holidays, to make them proper days of rest, where you can rest in Jesus and reflect on his good creation and recharge your spiritual batteries. One of those is to read a good Christian book, and if you haven't got one ready, 
then here is one that I can recommend. I have to say, it's not an easy read. But if you like life stories, it's an amazing story of the difference that one person can make. If you're prepared to lay down your life, it's called A Chance to Die. If you're prepared to lay down your life for the gospel. And if you imagine that being a missionary was all joy and harmony, this book will disappoint you. This is a warts and all account of the difficulties that she faced over 100 years ago. Amy Carmichael's story. There are several copies by the door as you go out, and they're free if you'd like to take one. It's first come, first served. Do help yourself. Even in the darkest of times, even in the deepest of pits, we've heard how the Lord is at work. And while we may not see the end of that story just yet, we know that there are seeds there uh, for how he works his purposes. And Anaxon captures some of that chapter in the words, uh, though troubles assail, me, uh, assail us and doubles of, uh, dangers of fright, this promise assures us the Lord will provide. We may not see uh, the outcome, we may not know uh, where we're heading, but we do know this promise that the Lord will provide. So let's stand and sing these words to encourage one another. Jesus. 
As we take a seat, we're now going to pray. Uh, our Lord is the one who provides, and He is the one who encourages us to cast our burdens on Him. Uh, Tom's going to lead us, but I'll lead us in a prayer uh, before He does. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of Your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and of your great mercy, keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our loving Heavenly Father, we cry out to you for mercy on behalf of the people of Ukraine, and we ask you to restore peace to their nation. Lord, as the war continues month after month, we pray the international community will not lose interest, but will continue to support the efforts of the Ukrainian people wholeheartedly. We thank you that the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal in the UK has been able to raise nearly 200 million pounds for relief and we pray that this money would find its way to the, 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 where it will be most helpful and where it is most needed. We pray that governments, churches, individuals, and businesses around the world would, will continue to ask, what can we do to help with the same compassion and enthusiasm? May you grant perseverance, courage, and strength to the people of Ukraine and wisdom and safety for President Zelensky and his team of ministers around them as they lead the fight for the very existence of their nation. May you comfort those who have lost family members and friends on both sides of this conflict. May you provide for those who are suffering the loss of homes and possessions as some uh, cities and towns have been devastated by the war. And may you even grow your church in the midst of so much suffering. And may you watch over and provide for your people there. And may you take the aggressor from their land and restore peace and security to the nation of Ukraine. And Father, in remembering Ukraine, we also bring before you the forgotten crisis around the Horn of Africa in countries like Ethiopia and Somalia and Kenya and Uganda, where a hunger crisis of colossal proportions is building and has been for months after the failure of three rainy seasons in a row, exacerbated by locust swarms and violent conflicts. Father, while more than 13 million people are currently waking up 
severely hungry every day, we ask that the international community will not forget, but will respond generously with aid and relief. For our own nation, we bring before you the election currently taking place within the Conservative Party, but which affects all of us. We acknowledge the truth written in Romans that there is no authority except that which God has established. So you are the one who will appoint our new Prime Minister, and we ask you for someone who will lead this nation in ways which are right and righteous and bring genuine justice and equity for all the people, not just for those who shout the loudest. In particular, we ask for a government which will protect the rights of free speech and the ability of God's people to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified with a needy world without hindrance. And finally, for ourselves as a church, we ask your blessing upon the Holiday Club taking place in August. May it be used of you, Lord, to reach many children in our neighborhood and their families with the gospel. We thank you for all the children that have registered already and for the parents, those in the church and those not, who are happy to send their children to Holiday Club. And we ask that whole families may be blessed and come to realize the gospel is good news for them too. We thank you for a committed team and pray their training and preparation will enable every team member to feel fully prepared for the responsibility of every child physically and spiritually. And we ask that the week will be a great success. Yes, and everyone having a really great time, but even more importantly, in the precious seed of your word being sown and finding good soil where it will grow, bring salvation to many. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to conclude our prayers now by saying together the Lord's Prayer, which should appear on the screen behind me. We say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, we may not be at the end of the book of Ruth. Uh, we've got three more weeks to go, but as Mike hinted, uh, there is good news to come. Uh, and that is the bigger story of the whole of Scripture. We may not be at the end of our story, but we know that through the Lord Jesus, good news is to come. That psalm we read at the beginning says this, Praise the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. So let's stand and sing and do it exactly as that psalm says. Praise the Lord who redeems our life from the pit.
who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be power forever and ever. Amen. Salvation and your abundant goodness because you 
Yeah.